Hi, my name is Mike Vinicor. I work at Stern Pinball, and I am an associate gameplay developer. What that means is I do some rule design. I oversee all the software testing and our field tests, so games. So we'll put games at location to track the earnings to see how people like them. Um, I work with every team on every game to help them map out their gameplay, help them balance the games, come up with rules, come up with direction, content. Um, I don't create the content other than writing some rules um, with the leads. And any other number of things they put me up to doing, like speaking at shows. And also give feedback to the team and things yeah, like that. Yeah. All, all, all the, and one of the, the themes of this talk is going to be it's a very collaborative uh, group of people that help these products come to life. Um, there's some key people that you'll hear, you'll hear about certain designers, certain lead programmers, maybe some graphic artists these days, some other people and some sound people. But there's a whole group in the product development team that helps breathe life into their products. Uh, my name is Mark Guidarelli. I work as the senior systems programming engineer there, which means I own kind of the pinball platform. So everything that's not the game code, uh, I'm responsible for from the operating system to the pinball frameworks to the node boards, if you know what spike um, systems are, the code that runs on the node boards. And then occasionally I'll help out on games, whether it's running a device driver or writing something a little bit more as time permits. Like Mike, uh, I kind of play on every team. Some teams need uh, my assistance more, or some teams need it less, basing if there's new technology being developed for the game or not. But I do try and help contribute on every project that goes through the pipeline. And I'm in the same way, where some lead programmers slash designers have their whole game vision mapped out from day one and know exactly what they want. Some of them might have holes in their design and they want they need help with some rules or mode ideas. So it really varies from from team to team and from project to project. Like the same team could work different on different titles depending on what that title is and how it plays out. Right. And one of the things I want to say is this will be a, uh, this can be an interactive discussion since there's a smaller group. If as we're saying something you want to ask an immediate question, feel free to raise your hand. And we will report, reward people with questions with free M&Ms, and we also have some shirts and hats. So, you know, feel free to ask questions. All right. Uh, right there. <laughs> so, uh, are you, are, do you do any uh, electrical engineering, or is it just code? Um, uh, I have a background in hardware, and I work, and we'll get to that on one of the slides. I work closely with the hardware team uh, to help with hardware, my input on hardware designs that would be useful from my software systems point of view, but help them with board bring up and other things. So good question. We'll get to that in a second on and, like slide and three fact. or four. Hey. Oh, <laughs> terrible throw. Yeah. So do you want to ask if anyone um, knows? Yeah. So now, in, in, uh, speaking of raising hands, raise your hands if you know who Steve Richie, Lyman Sheets, John Borg, um, Lonnie Robb, Dwight Sullivan. All right, this talk is not about any We're of not going to mention them yeah. at all. So <laughs> the, the, those are all the names that you know, and you might know Jeremy Pecker as Zombie Yeti, who's uh, doing like the phenomenal artwork on uh, Deadpool and Iron Maiden. You've heard about all those guys. These are the people that are behind the scenes that help everyone else. So getting into that, on the first slide, mechanical engineers. You know what a mechanical engineer is. They, per, they create devices, they do mechanical drawings, they do stress analysis, things like that. However, in pinball, they, if Steve Ritchie, who we're never gonna mention again, is the quarterback of the team, these guys are you know, like the offensive line. These are the people that help enable him. The designer comes up with the design for the play field. They do kind of the big vision of what a pinball is going to be. But the mechanical engineer is going to help the designer, because some designers work very well in, say, AutoCAD. Some others are working in 3D programs like SolidWorks for modeling their play field. Some designers sketch things on cocktail napkins. You know, it depends upon the designer what level they uh, produce their initial concept. The mechanical engineer helps bringing that to a state that can parts can be made to be sent out to vendors to develop items, the ball guides, the other uh, pieces for the play field, the exact layout of everything on the top side and the bottom side of the play field. Some designers do more of that work themselves, some do a little bit less and the mechanical engineer runs with that. Mechanical engineer also makes unique devices for that particular game to help realize the vision of the designer. 
Um, if you look on items like on, say, Iron Maiden, there's the, uh, in the back, the triple bullseye target, uh, while Keith L. the designer, and we're not going to mention designers again, um, came up with the original design, you know, Harrison Drake, uh, who is uh, second from the left, helped bring that to a manufacturable uh, design that meets reliability and other items like that. So the mechanical engineers are doing a lot of items to be able to bring these to manufacturer scale. We're going to be ordering, you know, 500, 1,500, 5,000, hopefully someday copies of these parts. They're also going to be making the, working with others to make the test fixtures to do life testing all these parts to make sure that they're going to survive for 15,000, 35,000, 50,000 plays without having any fatigue or issues. They, they will also, when a game hits pr the production line, they will teach the production line how to build these parts right. efficiently and they will even help them make uh, fixtures to aid in that. Yeah, specifically, they make, uh, there's some very specific features they make for every game. So the pinball play field is a piece of wood that gets routed out by a CNC machine. The majority of the holes get cut out by the CNC machine, but there are certain holes, particularly on the back, for alignment when they're assembling the things. We call them spotting holes. Those are done by a fixture. Has anyone ever gone to the Stern factory tour here? TJ, you haven't gone? Oh, I'm disappointed. Well, one of the things... One of the things they proudly show during that tour is this machine from the 70s, maybe earlier, they call it the pants presser. And what it is is it's a four-post big hydraulic press that presses down what we call a spotting plate on the back of the play field to imprint all the spotting holes for when they're assembling the game. That's one of the many fixtures and jigs that the mechanical engineer is responsible for. They're also responsible for some of the other, uh, during the assembly, for a proper alignment and finishing some of the holes for pop bumpers, items like that. So they, they have a lot of responsibility on all the mechanical devices. They have responsibility for uh, the assembly of the uh, play field and then also for uh, the jigs and fixtures used in that and the test fixtures while they we're de developing all the devices. And they make the engineering uh, documents and they coordinate with the vendors that make all the various metal parts. Because, you know, there's somewhere on the order of, what's the number we always throw out? 3,000 pieces that go into a they pinball yeah, machine. Yeah, like 3,000 unique so, pieces on every pinball machine. A lot of them are screws and bolts and things like that that are common from game to game. But then every game has its own ball guides, which are the metal piece, bent pieces that uh, guide the ball around the play field and items like that. And this is where the mechanical engineer, and they're on the project very early and they're on the project all the way through the end of going into production. And then even post-production, as we see uh, uh, life and wear in the field, they might make rolling changes on things, whether it be for manufacturability or durability. They also work with the vendors for creating the tooling to make like our plastic ramps, our metal ramps, any unique plastic molded parts like sculpted toys, they, they handle all that. Right. And then they work very closely with the team of ladies in the bill of materials. Now, bill of materials is the kind of uh, Bible for... It, it, yeah, it's the... Gabby and Letty, like, they... So when we get to the what's called the whitewood stage, where you've got a blank piece of wood cut with all the holes and all the components in a prototype form, these two ladies go piece by piece and log every single screw, nut, washer, device, all the wire, all the boards and electronics, and they have to calculate the cost of how much these things to make because we need to adhere to a very strict bill of materials in order to, be, to make a profit off of our machines or none of us have jobs. Yeah, essentially, and also again, the one thing I want to, I'll say a lot is we do this at scale, meaning you know we have the capability to build between 50 and 100 games per day. We're building thousands of each one of these games. Um, every penny kind of counts on this and also uh, you know, intelligent use of this bill of materials. We have a certain amount of money that we're gonna devote to the, every component that goes on the play field, and it's the whole design team's responsibility to work within that budget and use it the most effective to make a compelling game. These people, uh, Gabby and Letty, help them stay on track of what their budget is and help them go through that process. Um, they've also been involved with Stern for quite a long time and those subject matter experts on every part that's been used in essentially every game ever. So they are the good person to go to. Remember when we did Wheel of Fortune and we had that thing that did that thing? 
half the time they can rattle off what that part number is and also give us history about, oh, but we also upgrade that part over time or it's been substituted on a later game to a different part. So they help quite a bit. Now they also are the best friends of the mechanical engineers because as the game is being developed, they will help facilitate for the mechanical engineers to get uh, early parts ordered. Um, once the game goes into production, we have a whole procurement group that orders parts and mass. But while it's being developed, we only order, say, uh, you know, sometimes one, sometimes 10 or 12 of an item. They help facilitate that as opposed to going through the procurement and purchasing that would normally happen. And they have an unbelievable memory. Like, you'll just go, like, hey, I need this part for this game. You know, I'll use, like, uh, the super jackpot battering ram on Game of Thrones, for example. And Gabby can rattle that, rattle that part number off the top of her head, even though that game's been out for, like, three or four years now. And she hasn't worked on it since then. And... It's amazing how they can remember all that stuff. Right, and then also once a, you know, once a game goes into production, it's not pencils down for everyone on the team because you know we are going to run the game for quite a while. As it goes out in the field, we might find some things that we want to change. They will also manage the, those change orders and uh, configurations as the game you know is out in the field. And sometimes we'll go to, we'll switch vendors sometimes to get a better price on a part, and they'll constantly update the current price on like even from a game four years four years old to, right. so we, it, we always work at the most current information and cost and, and that's another thing that stern does is we have a deep catalog of games and while we have the uh current games typically for a calendar year that are available for purchase we also have some older games that are sometimes upwards of five years have been in the field that we rerun from time to time as demand comes up so again when we take a look at some of those games um, some of the vendors may have changed or might not be available and we have to switch uh, vendors for unique parts on those games from time to time. Um, next step in the process is we're going through the Whitewood. So the, mechanic, the designer has his initial thought that the mechanical engineers helped, started to do the, uh, help him get um, manufacturable CAD drawings for them. Parts are starting to get fabricated. We have another group of people that it, if you've ever looked on the inside of a pinball, the bottom side of a play field is vastly more complex than the top side. That's where all the wiring is. That's where everything has to be mounted. And that's one of those things is, you know, the, the customer and the player sees the top side, but the bottom side, we have to make everything fit without interference and serviceability. So uh, Jim and Raina are a large part of that. They help uh, figure out where the electronics are going to go on the bottom side of the board. Those are those node boards that I had mentioned uh, earlier. They also uh, determine the mapping on each board, uh, which switches, lamps, and coil drivers are going to be mapped to which board, which the software engineer is going to then need to do use later. Um, Raina also designs all the cables that then go out to the factory that are produced in mass. She also is uh, on the line probably for the first week of any game, working with them as the first run. The first pilot run of the game is where uh, the manufacturing line is getting trained up on the new game. You know, they, they have small pilot runs and then the first week or so, there's usually uh, designers, mechanical engineers, and Reyna often are at hand. They're not there the whole time, but as things come up, uh, they are available and will help giving additional training or tips on uh, um, how to assemble the game best. And they'll also make last minute changes based on, hey, if we change this, it's easier to manufacture or um, or it just fits better or like there's not enough wire here, but if you reroute it this way, right. it fits better. Uh, this gentleman had a question. Um, uh, sorry, Mike, to the, exactly to that point. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about this wiring thing? Because that, that's not really a cap anymore. Flexible and all, and I've seen the videos of the tool and how they put this. Can you talk a little bit more about how they determine <coughs> what the wiring strategy actually looks like? Here? Yeah, the, the, it, it's the wiring strategy is going to be a couple of things, right? One is we want to have it the easiest to assemble, the easiest to service, and also use the least amount of wire, right? Just because that's a cost, and it, it's it, it, and also that is goes hand in hand with serviceability. You want well-designed cables. So um, Reyna is gonna work 
uh, with the gentleman in the next page. In the build-up lab, when they're building up these early white woods, they're going to be in there and looking at their strategy on how they want to run all of the cable. And they're taking this all in mind. Jim and Raina are going to be figuring out where they want the boards mounted, which board will uh, drive which switches and which lamps geographically under the play field. And then they have some rules of thumbs that I'm not an expert or knowledgeable about on what makes sense on how to run wires such that there's stress relief, such that they are serviceable, such that it's too long enough but not too long that it can drag and get caught in with things. So it is an art form on making the proper cable. And there's also things like if this, you know, these wires and these wires, we want to separate them so there's no interference, yeah. such as like the stuff for like coils versus lamps. And, you know, she'll start, but, like, they don't draw it out on a computer. Like, they take their physical whitewood with the components on there and go there and with wire. And it. they start dressing it and cutting it and then taking the measurements. And then they'll go in and draw, do the cable drawings based off their master cable. Correct. And they'll just measure it with, like, a, like a tailor's measure tape. Yeah. I always said, I, I'm very glad you answered that question because I always wondered if they would draw that out first or actually fiddle first with base rules and then... Yeah, it, it's more of you start with the physical form because it, it's it's kind of a 3D problem and you really, you can't capture it from looking just at a CAD drawing. It's something that you want to see how everything forms and then you also want to make sure that things are well when you're putting the play field in, pulling it out, nothing's going to get dragged. You know, as you're working on the game, nothing can get snagged and easily broken. So it's, there's an eye to manufacturability and serviceability on all of these things. And with our spike system, we have all direct switches now instead of using a switch matrix. So in the older days, and some other manufacturers still adhere to this, you had a switch matrix. So like one wire, like say white with the green stripe, it could be going to eight different switches. So you'd, in those days, you'd have to figure out the best routing from the, the where your main board was. It's driving it to how do you feed these eight switches the most efficiently and cost-effective way. And now it's just it's direct from board to switch because we don't use the switch matrix anymore. And, and that also helps serviceability because in the other case, if you had one go out, it could it could uh, take out a whole row or whole, whole row of switches, and, and it was a real pain. A lot try. more challenging to diagnose what actually happened. Yeah, now if one switch goes out, the only that switch goes out. It doesn't take its seven neighbors with it. The, so the next progression in this is so. We have the playfield design, we've started to do some CAD, we're starting to get some parts, we're starting to understand where we're going to put all the parts on the bottom side of the playfield. So this is in the prototype and Whitewood lab. Dave Cadeau owns and manages that lab. And he is the person that assembles the very first version and the second version and the third version because we usually go through one or two, maybe three white woods on each game. He's the one that's doing the initial build up on each one of these white woods. He'll do the he'll do the first arted prototypes too. That's true. So we'll typically build three to five full games with art and he builds those by hand too. And all of these are, again, and Dave is a longtime operator and been in the industry, and he has an eye for the manufacturability, but also the long-term serviceability of things. So he is uh, always giving notes back up to the chain, the mechanical engineer and the designer and Reina doing cables of, hey, this looks a little bit tight here. We might want to move this over an eighth of an inch. Hey, we might want to do this. Have we thought about that? So he's the first person that's really putting every piece together on the game, helping solder it up, helping getting it initially flipping, to and gives the feedback to everyone else. And then he's also, again, you know, he'll support the line and everything else when things go into production. He also is not afraid to tell us every oh, bad yeah. idea we have. Yeah, yeah. No, Dave yeah. is brutally honest, and we love him. He yeah. does a very good job. What, what what the hell are you thinking is usually <laughs> how he prefaces his, his criticism on something that he knows is going to fail from his vast experience of operating games. Right. So he, he's, he works hand in hand with the mechanical engineers, giving them feedback on the initial devices and working with them to do the initial um, test harnesses for any unique device for a game. So when we're making a game, uh, let's say on Iron Maiden unique devices were that three segment bullseye 
the and sarcophagus. The, the sarcophagus on the, ramp that went up and down. The hit sensing Newton ball. And the hit sensing Newton ball. So we will make little test fixtures that are merely that piece and run them for months at a time through cycles to do accelerated life testing on those. So what are we testing for? We're testing for proper functionality that it's not going to fail earlier than say a half a million iterations or something like that. Some reasonable metric that would work out to it being in the field for say seven and a half, ten years before we would see any failures in that. So that's one of the things that Dave helps design those fixtures with the mechanical engineer and then one of us software guys help breathe a little bit of life into it and we lock it up into a closet and monitor it every day for however many months on the project. And then some, some items are still back there running two or three years later just because we want to see how well things, particularly when we bring a new device or a new electronics or a new supplier in, we are going to retest and requalify all those items on you know, accelerated life testing. For example, we have a Game of Thrones dragon that has been flying now for how many years has that game been out? Three and a half years. Three and a half it's years, been and it's still, its and it's still going, and flapping its wings 24-7 for three yeah. and a half years, never has gone off. Yeah, I call it the, yeah, call we call it the, the shake and break lab. Yeah, they call oh, it that, or the click and bang room. It's yeah. a secluded part in the back of the factory behind locked doors, and it, you just hear coils firing and, and yeah. things going off it, it, it's, all it's day long. It's nonstop banging. Which is why it's in the back of the factory where it's masked by all the production noise. Like, we don't hear it in engineering or anything. Right. It's way in the back, so um, could you give that man some arms? Dave also <laughs> has to support all of our development cabinets, so he puts together all our dev cabinets and units, and he has to fix them when they break. Well, and, and also update them, because again, yeah. when we go from you know Whitewood 1 to Whitewood 2 to, to screen 1 of a play field, generally something has changed, you know, and he's uh, the one that will migrate the software engineers and the developers from cap, you know, revision A to B to C and things like that. And if my software testing games in my office break, I usually get Dave to fix them too. So uh, my best buddy are the hardware engineers, Chuck and Simon. I work with them very closely um, since I, I do all the system software uh, on the uh, games and also on test harness. And whenever we're doing, um, we'll do uh, incremental upgrades on hardware and that could be for various reasons of cost efficiencies or sometimes uh, in the modern world of electronics, parts come and go in availability or lead times on the most trivial parts of a resistor and capacitor suddenly go from immediately available to taking 26 weeks to order. So we may have to find a new supplier or vendor or change uh, a part out, and those are one of those things that you know the three of us all will requalify that part uh, and issue a new revision on it if needed. Then also there's uh, we're constantly advancing the technology, of course. So whether it's something triggered by the design team wanting some new sort of effect with lighting or motors or some other item, or if uh, something that we've identified as a possibility of doing a, a something additional with the system or a new technology that we want to provide to the developers and designers, the three of us all work on that. They do the heavy lifting of the hardware I give it, I provide my feedback on what I would like to see or something that might be better or uh, something that might work a little better in our use case and then we all work through that. A fun fact about Chuck is he's been in the industry for 40 plus years Yeah, and he started in the early days of Williams Electronics. Yeah, actually Chuck designed the hardware for the Defender video game way back when. So the original Defender Stargate Robotron board set, he was also a key part of um, the Williams and WPC all the heyday of the Williams uh, pinball hardware as and well. Then, and, and then in the 90s, he worked in the video side along with the two of us yeah. um, on, on doing the video stuff. And, so. and then Simon worked with him in the later era of WMS when there were solely slot machines. Yeah, which is where he worked until he came to work at Stern. Exactly. Now these are all the, there's software engineers, you've heard of several of the software engineers and we're not mentioning them anymore. These are all the ones that you may or may not have heard of and that everyone contributes whether some, some are lead uh, software engineer on a particular game title, some are system people like me that kind of help out on all titles. Some people specialize on user interface and shell and some of the portions of the game uh, across multiple titles and they'll 
uh, go from title to title to title. We all wear lots of different hats and it's kind of what is the opportunity or what does the company need us to work on and we work on that. And some, some guys will be lead on one project and support on one project. It really, just whatever the game needs at the time. Um, when guys ramp off a of one, they'll go jump on another one to help the lead designer on that one you know, get farther along and take some of the load off of his plate. Right, and, and some of the ones, I, I can hit some highlights of some what some of the guys here have done. Brett is a relatively newer hire. He worked with us all at Midway Games. Um, not sure if he was around for when we were doing arcade games. He may have been just for consumer games. And he did a significant amount of the shell uh, programming of the nice user interface and graphics that were in the Iron Maiden game. Corey has been what we call like a wingman role, so he'll be a significant second programmer on a lot of titles and he was working very closely with Dwight Sullivan on say Star Wars and Game of Thrones and Ghostbusters. He's uh, currently he's working with us on Deadpool where yeah. he's done uh, you know we'll design rules and modes and we're like Corey this is what we want and he's just a he's a yeah, rock he, star of a program. He, he's he just, a rock star that, it that out. gets things out yeah. very quickly. Uh, and he did a lot of work on Iron Maiden as well. Yeah. Dean was another person that worked with us at Williams Electronics in the pinball division way back when in the '90s. And he uh, worked on Congo. Yeah, he did uh, yeah. Congo and Safe Cracker. He worked on those. He also did the uh, home version of the ELG version of Spider Man. He um, did the Supreme he game. Did the Supreme game as well. Yeah, and he's working on some feature stuff for us Future as well. Wayson was uh, mostly a support programmer. He was a lead on X-Men and the WWE game. And since then, he's worked a lot with Lonnie Robb as his, as his number one support guy. So he worked on KISS, Aerosmith, Guardians of the Galaxy. Um, he's currently working... He was working on Deadpool, and then he just ramped off to help out on a future title. The next great thing. Yeah, on the next great thing. And Mike Kisvet, um the vault edition, the comic book edition of Spider-Man, he was kind of the lead person on that transition uh, and then has done a significant amount of the uh, shell and user interface programming across all titles, typically supporting Lonnie or Dwight. Uh, Rick was the lead on Iron Maiden, a fairly recent uh, joined the company, also worked with us at Midway. There's a, a lot of things that you'll see that a lot of us came from Midway Games or Williams Electronics. There's a, kind of in Chicago, there's a pool of software engineers that have done uh, uh, arcade and consumer video games or slot machines that have worked together quite a number of time over the last 20, 30 years. Yeah, for example, this is my the end of my 25th year in the game business, and I started at Williams Valley Midway in 93, and that's where I met Mark, and a it's couple years later. the third time we've worked together. This is the third company we've worked together in this industry, so I'll, um, a lot of product development at Stern, I'd say a little less than half of them when I came to work at Stern a little less than two years ago were all guys I worked with at Williams and at Midway. So my first day at Sturm felt like coming home. Like a, the, it was just like, wow, this it's is very, right. very familiar. And that, that was, that yeah. Was really and, uh, there's a reason why a lot of us have stuck together for the last, you know, two to three decades. It, it's, it's, it's hard work, but it's fulfilling work. And the people are generally very nice to work with and all like-minded. Yeah, so, I'll, I'll go yeah. to Tanya. Uh, Tanya was a support programmer for a long time. He was also before Mark came on board, he was one of our system guys. And then, uh, starting with Deadpool, this is the first time Tanya has been a lead on a project. And um, I'm sure it, was not the, it won't be the last, but right. he, uh, he was very into the Deadpool project and had expressed interest in being a lead for a very long time. And this was the, he was given the opportunity with this one. And then Tim Sexton was, uh, I think, our most recent uh, hire in software engineering. Uh, and our youngest as well. And our youngest, very young. Makes me feel very old. Um, uh, got him out of New York, enthusiast uh, and software engineer, and he's coming in, hitting the ground, running very hard. And he worked on uh, Deadpool with Tanya, kind of played. I, 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 Corey, Corey was the wingman on that, but uh, uh, Tim was uh, kind of like, you know. The, uh, Tim started on Iron Maiden as a support yeah. role, and it, he was only on it for a few weeks, maybe a month, and then they put him on Deadpool. And Tim and I helped Tanya a great deal with some rule design. And then when Tim left to start another project, um, I, picked, I picked up the rest of that rule design with Tanya. And uh, now Tim's also working on a future great title where he has a very, a very strong lead role in it. So the in-game graphics, so you know, yeah, please. Uh, I've got a few programming questions. Sure. So what languages do you guys typically work in? 
Okay, very good question. Okay, so programming languages we use are C and C++. Primarily C++, we're uh, trying to be more modern C++, if you know what that means, C++ 11 and beyond. So yes, we're certainly pushing towards trying to be more modern. Some of the framework, though, is still kind of ANSI C to C80, C++ 89 type era, because some of this has been fielded for 20 plus years, so, but we are moving things forward to being, you know, modern C++, handful of assembly for some uh, parts of the deep down in the operating system, things like that. Linux-based operating system like most these days running on, you know, what you would, uh, the hardware is kind of a system on chip ARM type solution with a OpenGL hardware core, things like that. So it's it's what you would kind of expect from an embedded system, but it is truly, you know, a real-time embedded system that we're running on. What size t-shirt do you wear, as long as it's large or extra large? <laughs> What's that, large? Here, come on up. So a couple of years ago, so we went from what we called Spike 1 to Spike 2, and the way you can tell those games is one was a dot matrix display, and then we suddenly went to like a 1360 by 768 uh, LCD color display. That's Spike 2. So starting with that, now that stepped things up quite a bit. It, it, it actually changed the business quite a bit because now you have essentially HD quality graphics so you want to have pretty graphics up there of course. Now when you go from license to license some licenses will come with a rich amount of assets provided. Say something like Star Wars. We have three movies and like two plus hours worth of movie clips in that game. Tremendous amount of assets came with the license. Batman was another prime example yeah, of Batman like, was a tremendous example. Here's 120 example. episodes and here's the small list of the stuff you can't use. Yeah, the small number of items you can't use. Now then you go to another license list, something like Aerosmith, where we get a rich amount of audio assets, but virtually nothing for video assets. So this is where you know we have a team, the in you know the artists, the artists that do the in-game content. From project to project, they're going to get a style guide that came with the license, and within that style guide, we'll give them the elements that we can use for that. And they have to work with the rest of the design team to come up with the whole look and feel for the game. Everything from what font the game is going to use for the score and lettering to what we call the score frame, how we're going to present the score and that one element that's constantly on the screen, and then to all of the elements that we need for within the game. We know that you're going to probably do something when you say extra ball is lit, extra ball is gotten, you know, these various parts of the game. So they're going to be taking a look at what's provided with the style guide and what we got with the license, what can be used effectively in the game design that the team wants, what they're going to have to create. So they're going to be handling all of that. And there are some licenses where virtually we get nothing look and feel wise that they're going to be modeling everything, rendering it out, and touching it up. Something on Deadpool, for example, if you've gone out and seen the Deadpool game, there's a fairly rich fighting game going on in the background. Guess what? They modeled every character in 3D, high resolution. They rendered them out, then they ran it through filters to bring it down to an 8-bit, 16-bit looking, then they hand-touched up each frame. So a tremendous amount of work went on every bit of that background to take it from you know a pathway that they're used to doing very high resolution modeled items in 3D and bringing it down to that stylized 16 bit which should resonate with the retro group here. So well, what he's saying is there was a lot of extra work to make it look like it's 20 years old. Right. Yeah. Right. It, 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 exactly. And and you know with the style guide with that one that was based on the comic book which obviously Jeremy used for reference on his playfield artwork package in the background. These guys are responsible for everything that goes on the LCD uh, screen, and w amongst them. Oh, they also have to work with our licensing guy to submit all these assets to the licensors for the approval. So, you know, they might have only given us, you know, here's the, the art that we gave you, and you got to make the rest. They have the licensor has to sign off on all of that. Right, because we're taking their intellectual property, we're using it in some manner, and we have to make sure that it's compatible with how they want their product represented. You know, you're not going to see them allowing us to put, say, cigarettes or something like that involved with some character. So, you know, 
they're going to be working and we have these deliverable packages along the way that we're sending to the licensor to get their sign off on. And obviously we do a lot of that early on before we go into full production because it doesn't make sense to do a lot of work on something and then have a licensor say, no, that's not allowed. So there, this, this, again, this team works on every game and they're working on, generally there's like three games in the pipeline and various, you know, from kicking off to going into production. So they're spread across all those and they have team members that are moving from one game to another to another. And they have people that are obviously have skill set and specialties on. Some are, are uh, better for modeling, some are bettering for human life forms, some are bettering for doing fonting, some are uh, some of the UX uh, storyboarding, because again, you know, they're gonna work with the design team being the lead uh, designer and lead programmer and do early storyboards on trying to capture what we want. We want to get approval from the licensor. Then we want to work with the uh, the rest of the graphics team to start to go into production on those. They will also support us. So say if we, you know, say for Batman, you know, we want to do a software update, you know, a year later, like Lyman and I will come up with a mode and we need a piece of art for it. Like we'll need them to create art for stuff, even stuff that we might have released a year ago because we decided to add some new feature to the game. And, and that's across the board. The sound yeah. engineers will do that, maybe in the software guys. I, I, I've done that on certain items. As we, you know, if we're going to do a new release, all the people that were involved with it one way or another will probably get uh, some contribution to it again. Production art. Okay, so most of you probably know Greg Ferrez. He's a famous uh, pinball artist and runs the production art part, but there's also Steve who works with that, with him. And there is a lot of elements that go, both go into the pinball machine and support the business, whether it's the banners that you'll see in show booths, whether it's the game flyers that we give out to distribution for sales, whether it's other printed materials having to do with the manuals and other items. There's also a lot of decals and the plastic sheets and a lot of other items that are part of the pinball machine themselves. But also, he helps facilitate. So Jeremy's going to create this wonderful artwork and he's going to deliver some PSD or some other files. Steve and Greg are going to coordinate with the printers to get these actually manufactured. They're also working with the printers as to as technologies uh, advance. When we went from doing play fields by nine or 11 silk screens, where it's pass after pass of a silk screen, let it dry, and then do the next one, to digital direct print, which is now continuous tone and beautiful. You know, they're and researching. Much, much higher res, too. Much higher res. So they're constantly researching the state of the art on how to get better quality art put out, whether it's on the play field or on the cabinet sides. You know, even over the last couple of years, there's been advancements in the technology that's allowed us to do uh, much better cabinet sides. On the Batman uh, uh, Super Limited Edition, there was a foil embossed uh, cabinets uh, decals that they researched and developed for that that were amazing. Yeah, so yeah, cabinets, back glasses, trans lights, plastics, um, play field, everything that art goes to, yeah, the sales flyers, the banners, you name it. Even like for launch parties, we've sometimes made drink coasters and they design those right. as well and get them printed for us. And, and they facilitate the printing of all the materials. So, and it's a, it's a two person department working with the artists that create it as well. So I, one of the things you'll see is uh, we're, we're a good sized company, but a lot of people wear a lot of hats and there's a lot of things to keep the machinery of the business running. And all the things that we're talking about here are product development. Outside of product development, there's a whole other world of sales and marketing and of course and accounting and executive, but there's also the guys that procure parts. There's also the guys that help, uh, guys and gals, that help with the assembly line and the manufacturing of it. And we'll t talk to them, not today, but at some point. Carson's kind of one of the go-to guys that helps uh, helps me quite a bit and helps everyone keep, he's, he's our IT technician, he runs the website, but he also authors the game manual. So this, this guy is very busy and uh, helps us get uh, you know, uh, software updates on the website. Uh, Sets up all of our computers. And make sure my machine's running, my VPN's running all the time. Great guy. Every, then, time, every time I release a software update, he's the one that updates the website so people can actually download it. 
And then, of course, a part of the management, and we're not mentioning George Gomez because you know who he is. He's the head of product development and our cre chief creative officer, but his right-hand person is uh, Mark Wayna, who uh, is, is, helps me out quite a bit. He helps, he's the executive producer that helps keep, for product development, there's also producers outside of product development, but he helps facilitate every project. He's the one that's helping keeping us all on track, reminding us of some milestones, but also unblocking any problems that we have. And I work with him very closely on a daily basis. He and I are I, always I, I do as well. And a f another fun fact from the past, when I, the last few years I was at Williams Valley Midway, Mark was my manager where I, when I ran the field test program. And then when I came to work for Stern, Mark was my manager once again. And he was the best manager I've ever had, actually. He's a good guy. He is also the bridge between product <laughs> development and sales and marketing. Yeah. So he helps both sides work together to get these products. And, and, in, and in kind production. of bridges the, the, the uh, knowledge and uh, uh, the gap of information between the two. So um, any, any questions? What can, yes, please. Uh, using Batman as, a, as an example, what, what um, or one of the examples, what drives a lot of the, um, the updates that you use, version updates and extending over time? What are the reasons? Is it, is it you know, to, to help increase sales? Well, there, there's one thing you can see from a version numbering of a game is as it approaches like 1.0, 1.0 is generally the realized vision of when the game team set out what they thought will be kind of feature complete or, or some metric that they thought they wanted to work towards. So um, things that are happening like in the first year or so are the complete game, the initial vision of the game. Beyond that, um, everyone's kind of an artist and everyone, as we play games or as they're in the field or as you get good ideas, sometimes we will do an update because the designer or the lead software engineer just wants to do it for their own personal desire, that they think this would be something that would make the game that much better, that people who own it would like it a little bit more. And sure, there's always an eye to sales. Anything that uh, a new enhancement that might make the game that much more fun or desirable could spurn new sales. But that said, you'll even see that we'll sometimes do updates on games that are no longer even for sale, say something like Walking Dead. So some of it is, it, it, the answer varies. Some of it is, you know, because of to help support sales, but a lot of it is because the designers or the lead software person wants to do it. So related to that, if, if um, a designer wants to do an update for one that's not for sale, is it tough for them to get buy-in from, or do they even have to, or is it just more of a passion? Well, it, 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 if, if, if you're asking someone else to do the work that would take them away from other work, yeah, it's a little harder to justify that buy-in. A lot of times the updates are driven by the software person because they manage their own time and schedule and they might do it on their own time and on the weekends and evenings and things like that, sometimes as a passion project, and that's much easier. But yeah, that, there is a consideration is if, you know, what's your return on investment on some of those items? Go ahead. Um, what about um, dealing with specific IPs? Um, would it possibly be in the contract stating that would not be able to continue working on the product after it, X amount of time? Pot, well, there is, um, IP generally have a amount of time that you can sell new product. Um, also, when we get sign-off, when we were doing with the license or in submitting packages, we get sign-offs on certain items. We will get sign-off, and that might that will address even future updates that aren't realized right away. They're going to sign off on the use of their intellectual property within certain confines. So, yes, we're there is a time limit on how long we have that license to create new product, but we also get uh, very dis uh, definitive abilities to use the product so we can do updates. Yes, please. Um, about non-stern games, so are there games out there that you're personally fan, um, fans of the engineering? You know, I, I um, there is always, you know, even in competitors and, and, and companies that don't exist anymore, you know, 
you know, they, there's always something interesting, and I like other people's approaches. Certainly some of the older games, Premiere had some interesting things on how their pop bumpers went in, where people are going with technology. You know, I'm gonna look at every product out there, and there's gonna be something interesting, I would say, in just about everything. I'll play every manufacturer's yeah. game, new and old, and I go into every one with like a clean slate in my mind of like, hey, I'm gonna give this game a fair chance. I like a good game, no matter who made it. Um, not really. It, it's hard to say. An idea. Yeah. I mean, um, generally on themes and st uh, items like that, no, because there's you know there there's a, a a lot of good themes out there, and we all probably have our own dream list of themes that we would think would be good for ourselves personally, but ones that would be. Uh, you know, viable across, you know, a large demographic. From technology point of view, um, I'll see if there's something new and interesting. Um, I'm not gonna say that there's generally something where someone comes up with some great new invention and wows us or something like that, but it's always worth looking at what everyone's doing in your industry, no matter what. I'll tend to play them and then, and inevitably I can't help but look at them with a critical eye of how I would have done it different. You know, for like the game rules and gameplay side stuff. And, and also some of the things I'll look at it is um, use of that bomb, the build materials and the money of how they spent their money and what their return on investment is and thinking about the numbers that they're going to sell versus the engineering time versus other things. So it, it's a complex formula, I'd say. It, there, there's nothing where you say, wow, that was good or that was bad. But it, it, it's all within kind of... The, the formula of how big the company is, how many items they're gonna make, how long they're gonna be able to run it, you know, what's the serviceability of it. So it, it's, it's kind of complex. We just got the go home sign. Yeah, I think we got the go home sign, but Mike and I are gonna be at the Marco Specialties booth, which we encourage you to come visit and play yeah, some we'll, games. We'll, we'll, we'll happily continue answering questions in the Marco booth right after this, yeah. right after we walk out of this room, we're going straight back there. We, you know, you could ask us questions for the rest of the night if you want. And, I got yeah, more stuff to get away. If anybody wants to challenge either one of us to a game, maybe you um, can win some. You can swag. win some prizes if you beat if you beat us in a one on one or a yeah. three on one game. Um, well, uh, we got a bunch of stuff to give away, so please come by and yeah, and, and we can and, continue the questions and, and, and answers. And when we're and off, games. Mike, we might talk to you about more things. I can not dance as much on some stuff. Yeah, yeah. So we're heading there. Um, we'll be back in there in five But I'd love minutes. to have all of you stop by. If you have any questions about pinball, even if you don't know much about pinball, we can open a game up, show you things, answer anything you want. So please stop by. Thank Thanks you all everyone. for coming.